Testament. We are under law with Christ, so it's, it's like anything else. We can learn from the Old Testament and learn a great deal, but our main concern is what Jesus and his apostles have to say about these issues. Thanks, guys. All right, Proverbs, somebody turn over real quick. Let's do this. Proverbs 26, 17. Somebody read that for us. Proverbs 26, 17. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going by a strange dog and grabbing it by the ears. What might happen? You get your face bit off. Well, some of the stuff we're going to look at this morning, particularly in Luke chapter 12, follows that scheme, you might say. Uh, I remember hearing Andrew Connolly. I don't know if you've, any of you ever heard of him, but he, he lived in Texas, preached in Texas, did a lot of mission work, I think for over 20-some years, did mission work in Africa. Well, Africa has the Andrew Connolly School of Preaching. So, but he was telling a story of two elders who were brothers. They were elders in Texas at different congregations, and they were both in the oil business. I think it was you know, passed down in family and wealthy individuals, and they got in a fight one day over money, and one shot and killed the other. Brothers, elders in the church, and they got in an argument over money. And so one who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own will is kind of like one who's <clears throat> walked by and grabbed a dog by the ears. When we talk about money, that's very personal. You know, that's my money. I earned it. I worked hard for that. And so uh, money is a very personal matter, and... Yet, the New Testament is full in the teachings of Christ. Uh, many times he touches on this. So what we did last week, we'll just run through this real quick because I know some of you weren't here. We looked at all the, well, not all. We, we looked at a majority of the terms that are used in the New Testament in regard to finances. Some good, obviously, and some not good. Covetousness, things like this are not good. There are different weights, such as a talent. A talent is a weight. You've got different types of coins, like a denarius, a mite, um, you've got silver and gold. So you have all of these terms that are used throughout the New Testament. Uh, we went through then several verses in the Proverbs because, like I said, it, while we are under law to the New Testament, there's much we can learn from the Old. And the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about finances. Well, who wrote the book of Proverbs? Okay. So he might have some experience with finances, you think? Then we, uh, what we did was we went through and looked at definitions of these terms that are used that, we, uh, that I had on that list there at the beginning. We didn't look at all of them because a lot of them are pretty straightforward. We don't really need to look at them, but it's good to understand when you're reading the Bible, not just to read it, but what do these words mean and how, okay, how do I then apply those principles to my life? So we looked at those words yesterday. Yesterday. We didn't look at anything yesterday. I wasn't here. Neither were you, as far as I know, last week. All right, so let's start in Luke chapter 12. And uh, this is your, your paper that has the bullet points. This is what we're going to break down two texts here in Luke, Luke 12 and Luke 16, and just take away some thoughts from the text here to help us develop our thoughts on the New Testament and finances, the Christian use of finances. We're going to we'll have today and then, you know, Lord willing, two more Sundays, we'll talk about contribution, we'll talk about stocks and investments and things like this, gambling, you know, a lot of things that, that come up when we talk about the use of money. So Luke 12, if somebody would please read that text for us, Luke 12, 13 through 21. Take care of one's insane, the ground of a certain rich man brought 
Okay. Pretty familiar text to us probably. But a couple terms I want you to notice here in verse 14. This individual asks Jesus to obviously divide the inheritance. And Jesus responds there in verse 14. And he uses two words here. Who made me a judge or a divider, the King James says. And I'm just looking at these terms here. A judge is an umpire. So that's the, what that term means. A party who stands between two to make, to make decisions. And then uh, divider, the, if you look at a new King James, it uses the word arbitrator. And so that, the, the idea behind that word is, is like one who stands in a legal position in financial matters. Uh, to help, you know, to help people come to, uh, you might say, to come to an agreement over financial matters. What's Jesus' response in this family dispute over money? No, that's not my job. That's one of the first things I notice here. Jesus would not get involved, in this case, in familial financial decisions, disputes even. Um, you can go back, of course, and I have it written here in the margin of my Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, you have these laws. Of course, Jesus being a Jewish man living under the, the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 21 talks about um, inheritance rights, firstborn inheritance rights, division of property after death and things like this. So the law is very clear. So that might be what Jesus is saying. I'm not going to get involved you know what the law says, or you can know maybe what the law says. So that's point number one. And uh, like I said earlier, that this the, the subject of money is, I, I've had this experience, you know, you preach on or teach on contribution and things of this nature, and folks get pretty defensive. It's none of your business. Well, I find it interesting that Jesus, what he does is not get involved in that family dispute, but he teaches them how to use their money. Or maybe how not to use it, let's say it that way. So obviously then he tells this parable of this rich fool. And verse 15 is kind of the, well, verse 15 and verse 21 are kind of the keys to understanding this text. And particularly there in verse 21, a man's life does not consist in all the stuff that he can get. Okay, that's my paraphrase there. That's not what your life is about. And it seems his answer that's the issue with this person who spoke up and said, um, tell my brother what to do with the money. Uh, so the second point is here, that warning. And a warning that, that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Life is not about your stuff. And the acquisition of more stuff. And you've heard me, well, we talked about it last week. Is wealth ever condemned in Scripture? No. Money's money. You know, and you could think about that. You could lay a stack of $100 bills somewhere. Just lay it there, and that money's not going to do anything good, and it's not going to do anything bad. It's just going to sit there, isn't it? Well, it's the, pro the, the problem with it is, is those who possess it. That's the problem. Money is just a thing. Uh, so the warning then is your life does not consist, again, in all the stuff that you can get. Now, this account here in Luke 12, a lot of the parables... You can find in multiple Gospels. This one's unique to Luke here. Um, covetousness. Y'all remember what that word means from last week? Well, it can mean that. I mean, te technically, it's just a strong desire for something. And that's not always bad. It's not bad to have a strong desire for something. Um. And I told you last week when Paul was discussing the, the spiritual gifts with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, he said, covet the best gifts, uh, verse 31. So desire the things that are best for you and for the congregation at large. Well, that's not sinful, but covetous, obviously covetousness most of the time is used in a negative sense. So you've got that warning um, in verse 15. And... We've made this point, wealth not being condemned. What's condemned is selfishness. And as you read that text, uh, I'm sure, surely you've heard it before, the, the, uh, the eye problem. The, this rich farmer had an eye problem because you follow those uh, references to himself starting in verse 17. I, my, 
your, you know, you, you have much laid up for, you know, take your time, take, take your, he's, he's stuck on himself. So having a lot of money is not a bad thing. Having a lot of money and being stuck on yourself, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. And that's kind of what we see here. Um, and that's, that's precisely what is condemned in this text. Look again at verse 20. God's response to his... And, and again, when, like verse 19. I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. It's just, it's just holy. It's all about him. It's like there's no consideration for anybody else. And, you know, the context is, Jesus, tell my brother to divide... Well, the implication is, one of those two brothers was selfish. Was it the brother who wouldn't divide up the goods, or was it the brother that wanted Jesus to make the brother divide up the goods? We're not really told, but selfishness uh, is the problem here. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So, it, we often talk about, or we've heard it talked about over the years, you know, how wealthy we are in this country, things like that, and, and that's certainly true. Um, you know, everybody's in a different situation. Everybody's in a different situation in life, at a different point in their age, um, different, uh, you know, okay, so let's do this real quick. What are some things that, let's say everybody has a base, let's say everybody has the same income, okay, across the board, every one of us has the same income. What are some variants that play into your life on a regular basis that might make your income either more or less than mine, even though it's the same amount that we have. What are some, some things that we all deal with? Okay. It depends on how you handle it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other things? Those are absolutely correct. What are some other things that can play into your financial situation? Health, sickness, yeah. My dad's been in the hospital for a week and two days. I'd hate to see that bill, you know. If, if a person were to not have insurance and what else? Insurance costs you something, Dad. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we talked about last Wednesday or last Sunday in First Timothy six, not to trust in uncertain riches. To me, all these things that we're talking about make your riches, your possessions, uncertain. What else? What What are some other things? What about okay? College tuition. If you're a parent who has a child in college, that kind of stuff plays into it. Different hobbies. Okay, yeah. Do any of you do any of you eat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're doing all right there, aren't we? Um, what about um, well, our sources of entertainment? You know, there are all the, the point is there are all kinds of things. There's one thing I didn't mention. What, what was one, okay, clothing? What was one thing I didn't mention, though, that I've not said? Contribution. Your contribution. You know, that's something, you think about that. You know, and we talk about things that, that folks who are not in the, folks who don't go to church, let's just say it that way. And we talk about times like sickness and funerals and, and times where we as Christians, we really appreciate our fellow Christians because they step up and help. Um, well, Folks in the world aren't contributing to a local congregation. And, you know, depending on how much you give, that can have an effect. So the point being, uh, 
there are all kinds of variants that play into one's wealth or lack thereof, getting by okay or just barely, as we say, scraping by. Um, bills, you know, we, we have houses and you have your electricity and your water and all of this stuff that plays into it. And we're all different in that way. The point here in Luke chapter 12 is not to condemn having things. It's verse 21. Well, it's the warning of verse 15, but then it's verse 21 ultimately. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And one, and so in Luke's context, one, I think a great example of being rich toward God is back in Luke chapter 10 with the Good Samaritan. That guy was obviously well off. But we might say he was rich toward God because he saw this man in need. And not only did he take care of the man's immediate needs, okay, he needed to be bandaged up, he needed to be taken somewhere, but then what did he tell to the, essentially to the innkeeper when he dropped the guy off? Take care of it? I'll take care of it. Yeah. So that, I think Luke 10 is a good illustration of what it means to be rich toward God. Any questions or comments on Luke chapter 12? Yeah, there is, and he's asking about contentment, and everybody's, everybody's different in that way. Well, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then all the way down through verse 19, he talks about possessions, and those who have, those who have a desire to be rich will pierce themselves through with many arrows. You know, if that's, if that's your goal in life, to, to acquire more wealth, and like this guy, essentially, to be selfish you're going to have a lot of trouble in life. Now, you may have a lot of stuff, but it's kind of like one of the Proverbs we looked at last week was the rich man doesn't sleep well. I mean, that's, that's a very paraphrase, but he's, he's got to think of more ways to make more money. He's got to hire more people to, to keep his stuff up, stuff up and all this. And, but yeah, 1 Timothy 6 addresses contentment, and there's not a set standard for every individual. You can be poor and content, and you can be wealthy and content. But the point there in 1 Timothy 6 is, tell those, tell, and he's writing to Christians, obviously, tell those who are rich in this world not to trust in uncertain riches, but in God who gives to all men. That's where your faith needs to be. And you can be content at any level as a Christian. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the widow of, of uh, Mark chapter, the two mites, Mark chapter 12, yes. Also, he was right, and, and by the way, Paul, that's, and that's a good point. Brother Simers mentions Paul in Philippians chapter 4. I've learned what, with whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. And he's actually talking about his financial situation because he's talking about the contributions that Philippi had made uh, to him and that he had learned to be abased, he learned to be at the bottom, and he had learned to abound. But in all things, and that, that, by the way, is the context of we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That's what Paul was talking about, um, one's condition in life. Any, and where was he when he was writing Philippians? He was in Roman prison writing that. I've learned to live without anything, and I've learned to abound. And in all things, I, I can be content. I can do all things through Christ. I can do any of that. Through Christ. And I think that's kind of what I was saying a minute ago. You know, as a, as a Christian, we have a different perspective, or we should have a different perspective on the world and on finances 
and ultimately on eternity than, than non-believers. Because ultimately, our goal should be heaven, not simply the accumulation of wealth. And so then whatever financial condition I find myself in, I can, now that doesn't, <laughs> we may talk about credit and things like that. You know, I've heard it said before by some that credit is a sin because the Bible says, oh, no man, anything. Well, if you're on, if you, I don't know many people who can go out and buy a new vehicle, just pay it with cash. There, I know there are people like that, and that's perfectly fine. But if you agree to a term, 48 months, 60 months, 72 months, um, you're going to pay a lot of interest unless you get a good deal. But if, you're, if you've signed up to pay a line of credit, you don't owe anybody anything because you made an agreement to pay it. And so long as you keep it paid, you don't owe anybody anything. So I've heard that weird theory that, you know, you can only, only pay for stuff when you have the money to pay for it because credit's a sin. That, that has no biblical basis. That's just a, if you feel that way, then you better live that way. But anyway, are you going to say something? Yes. There, well, it's, it's like Paul says, was it Colossians 4, 2? In every situation, give thanks. In all circumstances, give thanks. Well, the Proverbs, that's one of the verses we looked at last week in Proverbs. The borrow is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. So these biblical principles really draw out some practical scenarios that we face in life. You own a house? You're a slave to that house, aren't you? <laughs> All right, let's go to Luke chapter 16. Anybody else have any thoughts? Luke chapter 16. This is in a broader context, obviously, as most, as most passages are. But in Luke chapter 15, of course, we have the, the things that are lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, and then the elder son. All four of those things were lost. The, the parable of the prodigal son is, just, is not just about the prodigal son, the one who went out and wasted his money. It's also about his brother who couldn't stand him because he came back and was rewarded. He was jealous. But that parable is also about the father. So in that, it, within that context of those lost things, uh, there was a certain rich man, chapter 16 and verse 1, who had a steward. And the same was, what's a steward? Okay, he's, he's under somebody who's given him his stuff or, or his, maybe like a managerial position over his stuff, and he's responsible for it. And the same was accused unto him that he was wasting his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. All right, so you're fired. But before you go, you need to give an account of what you've done. Notice his thinking here. All right, well, what, what do I do now? That might be a good thought to have. He's taken away my stewardship. I cannot dig. And I'm ashamed to beg. I don't know all the implications of those statements there. I, I cannot dig. Well, if you're not willing to do something, then you can't, I guess. But anyway, here's what I'll do. Um, that when I'm fired, these other people that I know, they'll help me out. I'm going to help them out right now. So he goes around to these different guys who are under the same master and says, how much do you owe him? Well, one of them says... Uh, 100, verse 6, all right? Write down 50. Tell him you owe him 50. He goes to another one. Well, I owe him 100. Well, you go and you tell him you owe him 80, four score. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. This parable is about money and the use of money. He commended him, it says, the, and notice, he commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. 
What had he done wisely? He just cheated the guy out of money. He's, he's, getting, his, he's getting his future ready because in the present he's fired. and He's got to give an account. He's not so much concerned about the steward. He's already been wasting his good, or the, the master. He's already been wasting his goods. He is concerned about himself. And so what's commended here, keep reading, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Of course, we talked about mammon last week. That when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So a couple points here. Well, obviously the principle of stewardship. And this is, again, this is a parable about money. Uh, secondly, we will give an account. There's that principle. You know, the parables, they always have meaning. They're always applicable, okay? So we're going to give an account of our stewardship because it is a fact that you and I have been entrusted with many things. The steward was praised for his wisdom. The New King James uses the word his shrewdness. He wasn't praised because he was dishonest, which he was. It's like the master was impressed with how, <laughs> with how uh, you might say, just his dishonesty is quite impressive. <laughs> I've never seen anybody like that. And he commends him for, for, his, uh, dis, uh, for his wisdom in preparing for the future. And so we'll look at verses 14 and 15 here in just a second. But notice this here. He that, verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least. Well, the that which is least is what's being talked about in the context, which is stuff, okay, possessions, money. The, the, in fact, verse 9, the mammon of unrighteousness. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If you can't be trusted with small, simple, little things, why in the world would you be trusted with something major? That's the point being made here. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, uh, mammon, who will commit to you, uh, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Well, what I learned there from verse 11 is that God expects me to, to be straightforward in my financial dealings. Be honest. Don't cheat. Don't cheat others. You know, do what you're, however many different ways you can say that. If God, if, if you can't be trusted with money, which is the least of things, according to this text, again, verse 10, then how can you be trusted with your own soul? How can you be entrusted with what God himself has given you, let's say, in the spiritual realm? If you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, okay, that, and that's the point. Man, we could... What, what could we list? How long would be the list if we were to think about all the things that God has entrusted us with? Well, if you can't be trusted with somebody else's stuff, then how can you be trusted with God's stuff? And then we get to the point. Somebody read 13 through 15, please. Luke 16, 13 through 15. Okay, there you go. The Pharisees who were lovers of money. Because remember I told you this is in a larger context. Look back at chapter 15 in the first three verses. Who's he with? The Pharisees and the scribes. All of this, the, the parable of the lost things in Luke chapter 15, this parable about this unjust steward, they know who he's talking to. That this applies to them. All right, uh, fourteen. What's highly esteemed in the sight of men, contextually, is wealth. 
And these people that he's talking to, the Pharisees, were lovers of money. And their response to his teaching, the, the word here uh, in verse 14 is derided. King James and New King James says the same way, says it the same way. This is the word in Galatians 6 and verse 7 that says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And the word literally means you cannot turn your nose up at God. It's not going to work. It's not going to turn out well for you. Well, these guys who loved money, they hear his teaching on the unjust steward. They're the unjust stewards, and they just turn their, they don't care because they love money. And so verses 14 through 15 show the immediate application of what we're dealing with here. You justify yourselves. God knows where your heart is. Well, that's true with us too, isn't it? In terms of our finances. We've been entrusted with a lot. God knows where your heart is. Nothing wrong with being wealthy. Nothing wrong with being entrusted with someone else's wealth and taking care of it. It's all the heart behind it. And what your intent is, if you will. So we'll, uh, we'll continue this next week. All right, guys, appreciate your attention.